Welcome, everybody. This is For the Love of Money, where we are making you unapologetic about your pursuit of success by sharing the tools, tips, and stories of those who have already made it. My name is Chris Harder, and each week I will bring you incredible guests in order to prove that when good people make good money, they do great things. Welcome back, everybody, to another incredible episode of For the Love of Money, an episode that once again helps to reinforce some of the life-changing modules that we teach with the home study course, TheBlissHabit.com, 12 weeks that take your life from where it is today to the life of happiness and accomplishment that you've always known that you have deep down inside of you somewhere. Find that at TheBlissHabit.com. Now, prepare to have your mind blown because we're sitting down with preacher Josh Fierstein today, the preacher with over 3 million followers on social media. Now, Josh is not just a preacher. He's an incredible businessman, a social media expert who manages the monetization of huge celebrity A-lister social media accounts, and of course, the former pastor of a huge church. So we take this opportunity to really dig in and discuss some things that are on your mind and everybody else's mind. He talks about the miracle that cured his significant stuttering problem that he had up until age 17, and at the same time, pointed him towards this life of generosity that he's so passionate about now. He reveals where his over 3 million followers came from and what role pure vulnerability played in helping him gain this audience and how that same pure vulnerability can gain you the same type of audience as well. We discuss what the Bible says or doesn't say about gaining massive wealth, and we really take this subject deep enough to get to the bottom of the question, is accumulating wealth greedy or not? And you are going to love his multiple stories of celebrities and their acts of generosity that he's seen and all of his tips, not only on success, but about being unapologetic about your success because how it can make the world a better place. So roll up your sleeves, get ready, because this episode is epic. Okay, Josh, thanks for being on, my man. Totally appreciate it. Excited. Me too. So I just talked you up in the intro. I told the audience a little bit about you, but I'd love if you'd give us your idea of who Josh Fierstein is and where you came from. Well, I'm a fat man trying to make it in a skinny man's world. <laughs> and uh, no, uh, in all sincerity, I actually grew up in a little town called Turlock, California. Um, very, very humble beginnings. Uh, actually grew up believe it or not, in uh, some special needs classes, had a horrific speech disability, Uh, went to a speech therapist most of my life, uh, you know, all all the way up until about the age of 17. And then at the age of 17, after just kind of a miraculous encounter with God, uh, I had my voice and I just decided to to start using it for good and for God. And, And so that's kind of set me on this path of um, you know, from the age of 19, I started traveling, speaking at churches, ended up pastoring a church. And then about four and a half years ago, which is probably the crowning jewel of my life, um, after one of my friends passed away, I ended up marrying his widow, adopting his four kids and uh, who are now my kids. And uh, we just had our, our fifth. And so, you know, uh, it's just a story of how God's taken some bad things and, you uh, really painted them into something beautiful. Wow, that's that's amazing. I had about 100 questions just pop up in my mind from that intro alone. <laughs> so I got to ask you, what was this miraculous encounter with God that helped you turn this entire speech issue around? So even though I wasn't planning on covering this, uh, it's kind of funny because it's going to tie in perfectly with generosity. But uh, I had always grown up in a, in a Christian household with, with loving, kind, giving parents, watched them sacrifice. Uh, you know, I remember watching my, my dad literally take groceries when we didn't really have anything. I mean, we, we ate oatmeal uh, for breakfast for probably two, three years straight. And I would watch him take groceries and take them to other people. So he, he, he really set a precedence for, for generosity. And I had struggled with this horrific uh, disability for years and years and years, ended up 
having a very generous and in, in, you know encounter, this real experience with, with with God, to where I actually went home as a 17 year old kid. I got my 308 Winchester rifle, my snowboard, and everything, and went down and uh, sewed it in into a church program that was uh, helping out some needy people. But I was really moved. Long story short, about two weeks later, I'm in a service, had stuttered my entire life. And when I say stuttered, I mean, I talk like a over-anxious, overzealous rap DJ, like, do, 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 you know? And I can't explain it, but I walked out of the church that night and I had no stutter. And so um, I've been given opportunities to pursue NFL broadcasting and all of this other stuff that would have been extremely lucrative and probably a lot of fun, but... I really felt like since God gave me my voice that it was him that I was going to use it for. So, Wow. So you literally went to that church service after yep. one of your incredible acts of generosity as, as a youngster. I think you said 17. And you came out of that service and this massive stutter was just totally gone? Like you flipped a coin, it was gone? Like flipped a coin and it was gone. And I mean, it's impossible to explain, but I don't think you can really explain God. Uh, but there's nobody that will ever be able to convince me that he's not real because I've experienced it, you know? It's absolutely incredible. And then you talked about your father really setting the precedence for your now very generous mindset. Can you give us another example or a tangible example of one of the things he did that really left an impression on you? You know, the one thing that really left the impression, it was really a day in, day out issue of character. I never once saw my father lie to somebody. In fact, I would watch him take the bad end of a business deal simply to keep a good name. You know, and the Bible says that a good name is better than, than gold, you know, uh, because everything comes down to reputation. But he was kind of one of those ranchers that his, his handshake was good. And I remember specifically a couple coming back after having bought a car for their 16-year-old son from, from my dad. They came back almost a year later and said the transmission went out and uh, you know, and stuff. And I watched my dad give them all of their money back and take the car back, even though, you know, he didn't have to. I mean, it just, just a, just a heart like that. Uh, but I mean, man, it was, it, it was constantly taking groceries out of our own fridge down to people who were brand new to the, ch to the church and, and had nothing. So that's absolutely incredible. Like I can see why you've got this really generous heart now that you lead with um, after growing up in that kind of household. That's, that's amazing. Now, you're a preacher, but not just any preacher. You have over 2 million Facebook followers, hundreds of thousands of Instagram followers. I mean, I would call you an influencer, an internet celebrity, as much as I would a, a preacher. How did you get so many followers? Well, um, you know, it's funny because long story short, uh, about five, six years ago, I went through a really bad time in life, went through a very deep depression. And I walked away from the church and television ministry that I had, which were both extremely successful, had a fiance that had walked out of my life. And I found myself in a very broken, broken, broken place. Uh, but again, you know, going back to the whole God thing, I actually remember laying there in my bedroom wanting to pull a trigger. And it was at that moment that I thought everything was over in my life, you know, that, that I thought that uh, I would, I'd never amount to anything again. I mean, this girl had really, really hurt me. And long story short, man, uh, God just took me back to the story of the five loaves and two fish. And, uh, you know, of, of, of him taking those, that five loaves and two fish, breaking it and feeding potentially 15,000 people. And I, I, I had this epiphany in that moment that God could actually use my brokenness to bless other people. And so I just started doing videos, uh, being real, just videos talking about my depression and videos talking about my stretch marks and videos talking about, you know, gaining a hundred pounds and needing to lose it. And, uh, you know, uh, just about coming out of depression, about uh, overcoming it. And those videos started going viral. I think we've had four videos now that have done over a hundred million views each, uh, including developing the negative and stuff like that. And people started sharing, you know, I just kind of found, see, we live in a society where most people's idea of a preacher is some buffant wearing, uh, Rolex wearing dude on TBN. That's just begging you to send him 
you know, your last $10. And so that's, that, you know, it, very, very fake with this facade. But the thing that I found about this generation is people want real. They want authentic. You know, they, they don't want just some fake brand. They, they want the real person. And by just, you know, by, by going straight to the Internet, I really found that people, you know, and, and not using the high-end uh, cameras and high-end production, just on the other side of my cell phone, people really felt like it was authentic and real, and they really saw you as a friend. And uh, the videos went viral, and by virtue of that, the social media following has, uh, has grown. So let me get this straight. It was you and a, an iPhone or a cell phone. Right. Just getting raw and vulnerable and that is how some of these things turned into a hundred million views. I mean, it was just the content. Yeah. So there's there's a, there's a couple things to creating a viral video. Uh, one is is if you say something that other people agree with but don't know how to articulate, then they will share it. So I've so you know I, I've done videos about uh, you know the the power of wounds or say, uh, you know, a video about a $20 bill and you rip the $20 bill, but it still holds its value. Like things, things that people feel and want to hear, but they don't know how to articulate it. Or if you say something that other people agree with, but they're afraid to say, they'll share it, but they won't say it themselves because they, they're, they, you know, they can somewhat distance themselves from it if you say it and they simply share it, you know? So, there's really two ways to go viral, and that's by articulating something other people can't articulate or saying something that they just don't have the hair on their chest to say. That makes sense. Now, you didn't know those tips, though, on making something go viral back then. I mean, this was no. one of the lowest points of your life, you said. So I'm, I'm guessing sure. that wasn't the ambition that you had. You just almost saw this maybe as a one last chance to not vent but be vulnerable and, and help people, and maybe that's where you'd find your value? Sure, yeah. And he, look— I had, I had already done the television shows, had the fairly sizable church, you know, at a young age. And I knew what it was like to be in front of the camera. And a lot of these things are just very scripted. Social media is about being extremely authentic. Like people want the real you. They don't want a facade. And so this, this kind of fit perfectly because I was kind of in that place where I was ready to take that off and, uh, you know, essentially be vulnerable, be naked, let, let people see the flaws. And that's one thing that I think that, that social media influencers really need to understand too, is that you want people to connect with you and not just paint this, this image. Like people are tired of these people that are just extremely perfect and extremely fake, uh, for them to really connect with you on a one-on-one -on -one level, they, they, they want to connect with everything that you are. They, they, they want to feel like you're a family member to them and family members, you see the good and the bad, you know? That's absolutely incredible. It's such good advice for all the people out there that are, I mean, let's be honest, video is the new social media right now. Everything's going to video. And so if ever there was advice that people need to take, it's that it's be vulnerable. It's, it's bear your soul. It's, it's take your stance and, and, you know, and, know that and, people want to hear it. And, and don't, don't be afraid to take a strong stand too. I mean, honestly, the reason that probably some of my videos have gone viral is simply because I said stuff others were thinking, but were too afraid to say. And I know that a lot of times as influencers and marketers and stuff, there's this desire to be extremely neutral. But the problem is with being extremely neutral is that you don't develop, I would say, as loyal of a brand there's there's people out there in fact i've i've posted uh before some of the inboxes that i've gotten from people threatening to do this and this to my family and stuff and there's people out there that have inboxed me and said hey give me the guy's address i'm heading over there you know to take care of the situation now they're they're really loyal to my brand because i'm radical with my approach and for, for people that are worried about offending people, you know, and, and having opposition, uh, you know, it's funny. I did a video called Dear Mr. Atheist. Uh, it was the first video that did over 100 million views, the very first one, Dear Mr. Atheist. And you would be surprised because most people would say, oh, the video went viral because of all the Christians. Do you want to know the reason that video went viral, Chris? Yes. 
the atheist. I, we, we actually saw that there were so many atheist forums that were sharing. So if, if you really want a video to go uh, viral, sometimes your enemies or the enemy of your message will actually be your greatest evangelist because they'll share the video. And I mean, atheists were sharing it at, at the same pace as Christians were, you know, so so don't don't be afraid to tap into opposition marketing and sometimes let your haters uh, share share your stuff, too, or at least talk about it. That's you incredible. Know? So, you know, you brought it up. I was going to bring it up and ask you. You've taken some really controversial stances on your social media and on video, like you said. And, and you know, while this podcast stays neutral for the most part, um, sure. I can't ignore asking questions about this because it is such a touchy subject and a subject that so many listeners are curious about, you know, especially a lot of the listeners that are in the business, just like you of being an influencer, you know, do they stay neutral or do they take a stance? You kind of touched on it already, but does taking a controversial stance, not just help something go viral, but does it help one's social media and business or does it sometimes hurt one's social media and business? Well, I would say it probably depends on what sort of business that you're in. Uh, me, I'm an influencer and I'm going to appeal more to probably your, your conservative or Christian crowd. So I think it really comes down to knowing your audience. So if you know your audience, like, look, who, who would, who would Bill O'Reilly be or Rachel Maddow be or Bill Maher be, uh, who would any of these people be if they, they played it safe? Now, those are examples from both opposite ends of the uh, spectrum, but they're known for their radical approach. So they understand their, their, their audience. I mean, they, they wouldn't make it if they just played it vanilla. Yeah, I totally agree. Now here's the scary part of it. Here's what I really wanted to ask you on behalf of everybody. And, and that is how do you feel when you take a stance that means a lot to you and people start to take an opposite stance in, in big, big numbers as they have on some of your stuff Sure. You know, right below your posts or they'll post videos back to you, you know, some of which get really personal and, and even cross the line. How, how does that make you feel? Well, look, it's better to be talked about than to not be talked about, period. There's, there's uh, you know, there's probably a few instances where people can say that there's such a thing as bad pu uh, publicity. But honestly, I actually wear some of this as a badge of honor. If there's certain people that hate me and certain people that are talking about me, I actually wear that as a badge of honor. I like I don't take it, you know, as in any sort of offense. Like I'm I'm honored that I actually have enough influence that I can pick fights with some of the top names. You know, like you know, I, I'll actually never forget the first time that Montel Williams uh, started making uh, videos about me, and I thought to myself what in the world? Like I used to watch this guy as a kid and here's Montel Williams. That's responding to me or Sarah Palin, you know, vice presidential uh, candidate or, uh, you know, I mean the, the, I, th I think probably the greatest honor was when, uh, when president Donald Trump actually brought uh, one of the videos up in, in uh, one of his campaign speeches. But look, you're, you're going to irritate some people. And if you're not, you're probably not doing it right. So, I would say, like, j just look, you got to let some of it just run off your back and understand that they don't necessarily hate you. They just hate what you stand for and not so much take it personally. Like these these people on, on Facebook don't know me personally. They just don't like the idea that I stand for. And so it's more them hating the idea than them hating me because they don't know me in, you know, in a personal manner. So I, I think it's easier for me to differentiate that, especially now that I've been doing this, you know, um, four or five years. So was it scary at first being so loud and proud of a stance and, and starting to get some of this negative feedback on top of the positive feedback or were you built this way? Uh, well, look, I grew up with a stutter. Like I grew up, uh, actually I was removed from my school in uh, eighth grade because I had been in so many physical altercations because I was just constantly picked on. So I, I kind of say that time and opposition had kind of built me to, you know, essentially be able to take it because I was actually made of made fun of for something that 
was an actual impediment, you know, which was my, my stuttering. And I was a chunky kid, you know, so those things kind of worked against me at the time, but honestly, it, it toughened me up for what I think my life mission is now. That's incredible. What an amazing way to look at it like that. So speaking of what your life is now, you are a huge social media consultant. Um, correct me if I'm calling you the wrong thing, but you do a lot of social media consulting for some of the biggest names and celebrities out there. Sure. And social media seems to be changing so quickly. I mean, I almost feel like every month now. So right now, in this very moment, this very day and age, what is the best way to grow a valuable audience and a huge audience? Well, again, I think it's about finding the authentic you and then creating a niche around that. Okay? Not... You see, there's so many people today that are into building large audiences. And while while that's valuable to, to some degree, there's people that I know that probably have a few hundred thousand followers that have actually monetized their page more than I've actually monetized mine. And I've got a few million followers, uh, but they're very niche specific. So I follow a lot of gun pages, fitness pages, lifestyle you know, uh, uh, pages, entrepreneur type pages. So I've, I've actually watched and, um, uh, we, we've got a lot of clients that are in that space as well. Um, I have non-disclosure signed, but some of the top ones out there that kind of focus on doing videos, uh, and drive a lot of video traffic, even from their garage, if you know what I mean. Uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> these, 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 these are people that have built a very niche specific so I would say everything's about building something around your niche, period, uh, and and something that you can be passionate about because there's going to be a lot of hours that you never make a dollar. Uh, there's going to be a lot of hours that and, and money and time that, that, that you're going to put into it that you're not going to see a return on your investment right away. However, if you're passionate about something, then it usually carries you through, and then you're able to monetize that, obviously, on on the uh, back end. But I, I would say find who you are, build a brand around that. Uh, and, and let me, let me uh, point this out. I was actually just at a, a marketing uh, summit and we had the, you know, the branding person from Nike there. And it was funny because he, he said this and it really stuck with me. The woman that created the Nike logo did so for $70. OK, wow. you know, that that Nike swoosh. Yeah. And there's a lot of us that think that she got taken advantage of, you know, because it's it's iconic. He said, but, you know, that Nike swoosh may have cost seventy dollars, but it wasn't valuable until we put several billion dollars worth of branding into it, you know, mm -hmm. and and and, and build, building something around that. So I would say find out who you are and then invest in branding yourself and putting yourself out there. And it's going to mean you being vulnerable. It's going to mean you taking chances. Uh, I had to do that, you know, in some of my first videos and some of the stances that I've taken. Um, and, but Hey, try it, do it, you know? And I, I, I promise you this, if you build a, a passionate following and, uh, you know, if I could add this, this one piece of advice in give people value. Okay. If you give people value consistently, and you know this is something that I think uh, Gary Gary V or Gary uh, Vaynerchuk, as most people know him, does really really well. He gives people value on a daily basis, and he's always doing these videos that are not just inspirational but extremely informative. And he's given this, given this, given this, given this, and in the moment that he has an ask. The moment that he puts a video out there that he needs people to share, the moment that he has a book he needs somebody to buy, the moment that he has a program or this or that, well, people are instantaneously, they're geared to do that because they feel like he's given them so much. So I tell people, don't try to monetize your following immediately because it makes you end up looking like some hack pitch man. But give people value, chart like, and, and not just little tiny tidbits. Uh, this is one method that we've learned, and that's give people around 80% of your best stuff and then charge them for the last 20%. Ooh, I love that formula. I love So that almost falls into the whole generosity conversation that we always end up having on this podcast. Sure. I mean, generosity is not just handing somebody a buck. Generosity is 
giving massive value. Am I right? Right. Yeah. So what role does generosity play these days in social media? Can you give me some examples? Well, so one of the brands that we've actually built uh, is a brand that specifically deals with celebrities and generosity because there's nothing better than being able to marry somebody to a particular cause. Uh, so we've, so uh, I'm, I'm one of the co-founders of a company called Merchful, and uh, we do, I mean, everyone from corn uh, to uh, social media influencers, Sarah Palin to uh, just, just, you know, whole, a uh, whole lot of these, uh, bands and, and, and celebrities. And what we do is when we launch one of these, uh, items, whether it's a piece of jewelry or whether it's, uh, a t-shirt or something, we'll usually find a cause that we can develop that line around. And I, I really have to give credit to the brand Tom's. Many of you probably remember when Tom's came out, it, it, it really changed the industry because, they added generosity as part of their their sales pitch, their their brand. When you bought a pair of shoes, you knew that somebody in another country was going to get a pair of shoes as well. And people, it you know, it makes the whole consumer experience actually feel good. Like you feel like you're doing a part of something, and you're usually willing to pay a little bit more to do it. So the, the thing that we've started doing is connecting social influencers to causes whether it's autism, you know, like something that they're really passionate about. In fact, uh, for, for Tim Tebow, Tim Tebow is extremely passionate about uh, A Night to Shine. He puts on um, these, these beautiful, gorgeous proms uh, for, for people that, you know, have disabilities and would normally not be invited to a prom. Well, when he's able to take and he's able to put out a T-shirt or something like that and say, hey, a portion of these proceeds are going to support this, then all, then all of a sudden it makes the consumer aspect feel good. So the one thing that I would tell people, too, is allow people to see your generosity, not, not that you're just boasting about it, but that, that people are able to see that when they're buying into your brand, that they're doing something good. In fact... One of my favorite videos that I did with uh, a buddy of mine named Clayton Jennings, uh, and it's funny, at, after we did this video, his social media following took off from probably at that time uh, 20, 25,000, and now it's probably at a million in about two years since we've done this, this video. But we took a limousine, we went out, we found six homeless guys got them in the limo, took them, got them a haircut, a makeover, brand new clothes, uh, and took them to a five-star dinner, and then we had arranged with a local uh, place to provide six months of free housing for them. Well, that video went viral because people love the feeling of generosity, and it ended up being good for our brand, for my brand, for Clayton's brand. Uh, so it was good for our brand, but at the same time, we were able to inspire others, and we got inboxes from, from people saying, hey, you know, we may not be able to afford to do it just exactly that same way, but what do you think about this? And people were going out and replicating that. So really lead by example when it comes to your generosity. Don't be afraid to show it to the world because it really does inspire someone uh, to go do something for, for somebody else. Oh, Josh, that story is amazing. I love that example. You know, what you're talking about, I call con uh, socially conscious entrepreneurship. And I've taken the stance before that if you're starting a business right now in this day and age, you won't succeed unless it is falls under the umbrella of socially conscious entrepreneurship, unless you're attaching it to some sort of cause. Right. You know, I, I attach this podcast to a cause and, and I encourage everybody else to as well. Do you Do you agree or disagree with that statement that in this day and age, a business will or won't succeed if they are not engaged in socially conscious entrepreneurship. Well, look, you know what? J just look at the whole Occupy Wall Street movement, and 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 look at the fact. While I disagree probably with a lot of the stuff that 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 this you know that they were saying stuff that they were holding up on on their signs, y you do see that the the generation. Uh, that's coming after you and I, and and probably even our generation as well, are so socially aware, and they're really into humanitarian causes. So you're also seeing them turn against what they would consider to be, quote unquote, corporate greed. And so everything now is about you know down with corporations, down with greed, uh, down with money hungry people. Well, you know the only way to combat that is to say, hey, look, we're not 
amassing all of this money for ourselves. We're doing something with it, you know? And I mean, if you look at, at pretty much every major brand today, you're going to find people that are active in the community. I mean, you know, you, 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 you even have uh, huge brands like Starbucks that are making sure that they put, hey, when you buy, you know, a, um, you know, a pot of this coffee or you buy this bag of coffee over here, this is what it's doing. And they're, they're trying to show the consumer that there's good that's coming out of every dollar that, that they spend. So I would 1,000% agree with uh, that, yeah. Yeah, I love that. I love that the, the world is going in that direction because why not? I feel like right now the people with the biggest influence you know, are influencers and are massive corporations. So when everybody gets on board with attaching it to a cause, we're going to live in a, in a much better space here. Now, you brought something up that's really interesting, and that is what this podcast is aiming to completely eliminate if we can. I know that's a pipe dream, but make as big of a difference as we can. And that is everyone viewing wealth as greed, everybody viewing wealth as you know something bad. So from a preacher's point of view, how do you view money and wealth? Well, so it's funny because people have misinterpreted a scripture for a long period of time. And you constantly hear people saying, well, as does your, your podcast name uh, so eloquently put, <laughs> for the love of money. Now, it's interesting that people here automatically assume that money is evil. It's not money that is evil. It's if you simply love money to the point that it owns you instead of you owning it. Okay. And, you know, I, I've had a lot of Christians that have come and said, look, uh, you know, the Bible talks about how is a rich man supposed to enter he uh, heaven except that, you know, it's like a camel trying to fit through the eye of the needle. Well, what a lot of people don't understand is that the eye of the needle is actually a biblical term that for the place at the city wall, at the city gate, in order for a camel to go into the city, he would literally have to kneel down and they would have to unload the goods and he would have to go in without any of his goods on. Okay. So essentially what the Bible's saying is not that it's impossible for a rich man to get into heaven, because honestly, you'd have to look at Abraham. You'd have to look at Joseph. You, you know, you'd have to look at these people that amassed incredible amounts of wealth. But the reality was, is that they didn't own it. They were stewards of it. And, you know, it's, uh, it's interesting because if you actually study the, the, the Hebrew, there's something that's called the divine non-possessive, which essentially means that we own nothing in this world. We, we, we merely manage it, you know, because it was given to us essentially by God. So we manage everything from our time to our talents to our gold. I mean, everything is us managing what God has given us, which is, you know, I, I think key because have you ever heard that, that, that saying, you can't take your money to heaven with you? Yep. You know, you never see a U-Haul following a hearse. Well, <laughs> yep. well it's, it's actually untrue, okay, because you can actually take your money to heaven with you. And it's called generosity, okay? Look, if I'm here in the U.S. and I'm going over to, say, the Middle East, I can't take U.S. dollars over there and spend them because the, the U.S. dollar is good here, but it's not good over in, say, Iraq where they operate with the dinar. So I have to do something called currency conversion. And I have to convert that currency into dinar, okay? So that I can, that I can send it over there with me. That's the only way that I'm able to take it and it be of, of any use. So the same thing with life, looking from a, from a preacher or even just a Christian perspective, I have to realize that I'm here but just for a moment, but that I'm looking to make an eternal impact. So in order for me to take my money with me, it means that I have to deposit it here, convert that currency, which is really generosity, okay? And so through generosity, I'm actually able to send that money ahead because the Bible consistently talks about God refreshing the generous person, you know, talks about give and it shall be given. Well, for all, for all, all of these people that are against having wealth, well, if you don't have wealth, then how can you even give? I mean, a Abraham was a blessed man, 
But Abraham was a blessor. I mean, the Bible gives us many instances in which he would put others before himself and say, you take the better, and he would give to them, and then God would give back to him on a, like a multiple because everything comes down to planting. It all comes down to sowing and reaping. And the Bible says whatsoever a man sows, he's going to reap. And that's one thing that I actually have to credit my wife. I mean, you know, my father obviously had a huge impact on me being, you know, our, my, my, my generous soul today, but my wife actually had a much, a much bigger impact. When we first got married before, you know, we were really doing extremely well, uh, when, when we got married, we, we both had vehicles. And she said, you know what, babe, instead of us selling this vehicle, let's sew it into somebody. And I'm sitting here thinking like, what in the world? But we went and gave it to a family. And uh, I mean, the look, the look on their face, because they desperately needed it, you know? And, it, and a, after I saw that, and then a matter of a couple of weeks later, God gives me a much better vehicle than I would have ever imagined. Uh, and now multiple vehicles. Uh, and, and, and so I've, I've like, I've really bought into this. In fact, if I could tell one more story. Please before, do. I love this. You know, my wife started uh, saying, babe, we need to double and triple our tips, you know, and, and we need to be just generous to people that could never give back to us, you know, because if you're generous to your friend it, it can, or, or even a business associate, Sometimes it's more bribing. Like our intention is, hey, I did you a favor. Now you owe me a favor. But I think real generosity has zero stipulations attached to it. And so we started trying to bless people that we didn't know or that we, you know, would never give us back. So, I, you know, we just started this campaign. We would buy people's meals. We would buy people's coffee. But here's the crazy thing. One day I'm in a coffee shop and there's a man behind me. And he's looking at Danishes and stuff. And I just looked at him and I said, sir, you know, I promise, like, I'm not hitting on you or anything. I'm happily married to a gorgeous woman, but I'd like to buy your coffee and your Danish today. And he just looks at me, no way. And I said, yes, please. Like, I always do this. Anytime I'm at a coffee shop, please allow me to bless you. Long story short, I bought him a coffee and a Danish. It ignited a conversation it just so happened he was a CFO of a major corporation, and it ended up landing me a multi-million dollar contract. Wow, that's, that's an incredible example. You know, sowing and reaping. If you sow, you reap, period. Oh, I absolutely love that. So you just gave us a great example. I, I was going to ask you, and maybe you have another one offhand. You work with some of the, the biggest leaders in business, some of the biggest celebrities out there. Do you have any favorite examples of, you know, maybe – people who some think are greedy or they haven't seen their giving side, but are really some of the most giving individuals in the world. Do you have any examples of this? Well, the one thing I say is this, you know, there's, there's a lot of people that say that, well, if I had a million dollars, if I hit the lottery, then I would do this. I would do this and do this. Here's the reality. If you're not doing it now, money doesn't change you. Money magnifies who you already are. OK, money does not change you. It doesn't change your generosity level. or It only magnifies who you already exist as. And I have to say my favorite person when it comes to generosity and, uh, you know, especially being a celebrity is Tim Tebow. OK, because it's authentic. He's not doing it for a show. He's not doing it for anything else. This is something that, you know, he was raised in a family who was who was generous, who uh, were missionaries that served in orphanages. You know, there, there's there's no money in that. I, I lived in Mexico for a year and I blew through my savings, you know, just even as a single guy because, man, you just want to leave your money there because you realize, you know, that your your nice watch can supply, uh, you know, I, I, j j just this last week, I was sitting at lunch in Hollywood on Rodeo Drive with two individuals and collectively, between the two individuals, their watches were worth about $420,000. Their watches, okay? But you take someone like that, but then you go over, and when you're in these third world countries, man, you, you just grab the money out of your pocket because you see that there's such a need there and that your watch can provide, you know, 
<laughs> drinking water uh, and formula and, and, and stuff for tens, if not hundreds of thousands of people. So, but, you know, Tim Tebow, I, I would say he's the same guy on camera as he is off camera. And it's really helped his brand too. I mean, think, here, here is a guy that a lot of NFL announcers and people have just, you know, discounted him and dismissed him and, and wrote him off as, well, you know, he's not this or he's not that. But you tell me someone that has a more loyal following and is more adored within the realm of sports than Tim Tebow, you know? And it's not because of his athletic ability. And I, I, I argue that he's a phenomenal athlete. Uh, but he's long past his college days. But his brand is generosity. And it's because people have found him to be authentic. And so for, you know, seeing him go to the hospitals when there are no cameras on, uh, that, that, you know, that's the kind of stuff that really impresses me and really sticks with me and challenges me personally. That's incredible. I love that. Let me, you just said something that really sparked another follow-up question to me. And that is, you're talking about the guys and, you know, they've got a couple of watches worth 400 grand. Is it okay to like nice things? And I, I mean, $200,000 watches aren't just nice. They are extraordinary. Is it okay to like nice sure. things? Well, I think it's okay to like nice things. I mean, I'm, I'm a fan of uh, luxury uh, watches. However, when here's, here's, here, here's what it really comes down to. I, I think it comes down to your purpose in life. So every, every successful person, I, you know, I'm not going to say wealthy person because there's a lot of people out there that are trust fund babies, haven't inherited it, you know, from someone else, but usually by the third or fourth generation, they're totally different people than the actual people that earned that money. So, mm -hmm. so, so I would say successful people you're going to find that they're great with money management. They're great at looking and saying, okay, here is something that I can invest to that there's going to come a return. And the thing that I find about people that are first generation successful, they usually look at those things in life and say, well, I could do this with that. You know, and so what, what is this going to benefit me or bring me or what sort of seed is it going to, um, you know, is this seed going to actually reproduce? Now, let me give you a perfect example. Okay. I do business with high end clientele. So for me personally, I need at least one or two really nice watches. I need a car that's really nice. It's respectable when I show up to a business deal, because as we know, like that's a tool, you know, I, I, when, when, uh, I, I just flew out to, um, LA to meet with a couple of our celebrity clients and the car that they sent over for me was a 400 and some thousand dollar Bentley Mulsanne. It was one of the most gorgeous cars in the world, period. Wow. I, the, the lines on it. I mean, it was beautiful. It was luxurious. While I was there, I used it as a tool because everywhere that I pulled up to, it garnered me instant respect, okay? So I'm not against people owning a nice car if there's a purpose behind it and it's not just pure trying to dote on yourself. And there's certain things. Look, I love taking my families on a, you know, a nice vacation. I like to give my wife nice things. I love to spoil my, uh, spoil is probably not the best word, but I, you know, I, I love to dote on my children. I love to supply for them. But at the same time, I have to take that attitude towards everyone else too. And so for me, I think it's more of an issue of greed. And I look at money as being a tool. And so when I look at it, is it, is it wrong for me to have a, a nice watch? No, because I need it for business because the people that I'm hanging around, there's an expectation that if they're going to do business with me, it's because I, I look successful. I appear successful. And so there's that certain expectation. But am I going to go out and sink half a million dollars or a million dollars into some ridiculous watch collection uh, and, and forsake the person? You know, uh, let, me, let me pose this question back to you. Mm -hmm. What is more important, okay, my need for a nice watch or some African mother's need for formula for her baby that's crying all through the night? Or... You know, for a thousand dollars, 
In fact, probably my favorite project ever is my wife and I build wells in India up in the mountains where a lot of these people have a hard time uh, being able to drill in, in to the rock to even get water. For $1,000, for $1,000, I'm able to drill a well up there. And what we'll do is we'll connect it to a church. And so people get two for one. You know, that, that, that church gets people coming to them and they're able to kind of associate, you know, the living water uh, of Jesus Christ with just being able to have water. Uh, you know, it becomes a great evangelistic tool. But what's, what's greater, Chris, my need for a $10,000 watch or 10 different communities in India that don't have water and me being able to give to them? You know, it's a no brainer. It's, it's the yeah. 10 communities. Yeah. So for me, supply will follow demand and demand is attracted to supply. And so I have a supply and there is a need, there is a demand for it, uh, you know, so, so, so somewhere else. And for, for me personally, I, 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 I just see a greater return on my investment, even in the happiness of my heart. Because you know what, bro? I've had watches that I've purchased that were really nice watches, and I lost them. I've went through sunglasses that were luxurious sunglasses, and I lost them. But you know what? That well that I built over there for, for, the, for those people, I'm going to be able to live on forever knowing that there's a lot of people that are benefiting with, a very, with, with an actual human need, uh, you know, instead of me just looking good and misplacing something in a hotel room somewhere. Mm, I love it. I love it. I follow you straight on. All right. A couple last questions here. What do you think we have to do in order to further change this view of wealth is greedy or money is evil? What can we do? Well, I would say simply take action. You know, if, if look, we would not need the social programs that we have today. We would not have to spend the ridiculous money in, in tax dollars uh, that we do if we as Americans, particularly if I could speak to the Christian community, you know, there's a meme that goes around that I think does it so perfectly. It shows this huge, huge auditorium of a well-known preacher, seats probably 40,000 people. It has all of the top of the line equipment. And, you know, it says, look, why, why you know, is is a house of God a luxurious building or is it the acts of kindness that we take? Because Jesus said this. He said, look, if you go and visit people in jail, if you go to the poor, if you go to those that aren't healthy, this is the commission that he gives us. He never tells us to go out and build buildings. I mean, if you really want to be honest, probably some of the most sacrilegious acts are are building these monuments really to personalities and preachers than they are, you know, our, our commission is to go out and give and to be generous. Jesus said, if you've done this, you've done it unto me. It's as if you did it directly to me when you visited the poor and when you gave them food. So I, I would challenge the Christian church, particularly what in the world are we doing? Are we building these monuments or are we going out into the highways and the byways and the, the, the homeless people and the, the drug addicts, you know, what, what, what exactly are we doing? Because I think the American church has gotten so far off purpose. So we can talk about, well, you better not love money. Well, I would, I, I would argue that there's a lot of churches that love money because all they're doing is hiring more people and building bigger buildings when in actuality, building the kingdom is not building a building, it's building people. Wow. Good stuff, man. Good stuff. So I make everybody do this. I call it two minutes of bragging and some are comfortable, some are not, but either way you got to answer. And that is from your memory. What can you recall as one of your favorite moments of giving? Oh, man, probably being down in Mexico. And it's funny because we're talking about luxury watches and I had several luxury watches that I took with me and I came back with a zero because what I ended up doing was giving those watches to several of the different pastors that I was with and one to an orphanage there. And, I, you know, I, 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 I would say it's, it's, it's stuff like that. There's no way that those guys could ever repay me. Uh, but probably the coolest story was I was in Branson, Missouri, and I see an Indian gentleman 
and he's standing over there in Branson, Missouri, and I felt to walk up and give him money. And I was fighting my, it was just, I was fighting because I had a big wad of cash in my pocket because I, I travel with a lot of cash. And uh, finally, I just walked up to him. I took it out and I said, okay, God, I'm trying to be obedient to you. I just pray you honor this. Even if it's not your voice or inclination speaking to me, I hand a wad full of cash to the money or uh, to this gentleman. Long story short, he looks at me and he says, how did you know? And I said, how did I know what? He said, how did you know I was a missionary here raising funds? And this is how we got connected with, with, uh, with India. And these people have become lifelong friends. In fact, he flew all the way from India here just for uh, the birth of, of my uh, daughter. And I mean, just uh, precious, precious friendships. And uh, so, I, I, you know, it's those sort of things where, where, you know, you're doing stuff for people that can't do anything for you. That's an incredible story. I love that example. One of my favorites. I love how it turned out to be somebody there trying to raise money in, uh, on a mission. That's incredible. Right. That's nuts. You were definitely guided there, right? Oh, uh, un- undoubtedly. And out of that, we've actually been able to reach out to my social media following and my wife's social media following, and we've been able to build wells all throughout India and, uh, and you know, as well as hire uh, pastors, fifty dollars. You can hire a full time pastor for a month over there, and so we've been able to hire pastors and build churches and build orphanages and sewing centers and stuff. Uh, all, all as a result of of that one not so chance encounter. Wow, absolutely incredible! All right, before I ask you the last question, Josh, sure, I got to ask you this: Where can we find you? I mean, people are going to want to look up your coaching, your inter- your uh, social media coaching, all that stuff. Where can we find you? Sure. Well, just uh, Facebook. Uh, if you just go and type in Joshua Fierstein, make sure to look for the verified page because there's got to be at least a hundred fakes out there. So make sure to look for the blue check mark and in, uh, you know, inbox me. Uh, I love reading about 60% of them. So <laughs> <laughs> 60, I love the honesty there. And by the way, you, you also know you've made it when there's about a hundred fake sites in your name. Yeah. Uh, th- yeah, yeah, yeah. There, <laughs> there's, there's a lot of parody sites as well. So. Oh, man, that's, that's crazy. We live in a crazy world. All right, last question, my friend. And that is, why should people be unapologetic about their pursuit of wealth and success? Because you, if not you, who? Okay, so there's a limited amount of money in, in this world. If you're not pursuing it and you're not grabbing a hold of it, then somebody else is controlling it. And their desires for that money are probably way different than yours. So my wife and I have a desire to here soon live on 10% of our income and give away 90%. Now, I'm, I am striving for wealth. You know, there, there's a great uh, book out there. I believe it's called of men and mountains. And it's about R.G. R. Letourneau, who was a broke man, but he got passionate about the cause of giving. And he actually said, I'm going to give away 90% of my income. And he did, but God ended up making his 10%, uh, like tens of millions of dollars. And I, I want to say in ni- by 1959, he had already given away $50 million in 1959 dollars. Wow. Uh, so, so yeah, you know what? If you're not controlling that wealth, then somebody else is. So don't just be a priest, be a king, and go out there and get that. Because we can talk about our dreams to help people all we want. But if you can't buy them food, or if you can't you know, send somebody on a missions trip, I'm sick and tired of all these people saying, well, if God wants me to go to Africa, or he wants me to do this, uh, you know, then he'll send the money. No, go out there and get it. Let him give you some you know, ingenious ideas and put some hard work uh, behind it and watch it grow. Wow. Amen, man. I absolutely love it. What a great answer. And I got to tell you this, you, you get a kick out of this. Our message must be, must be catching on because you're the second interview in a row where they talked about giving away to, or tithing 90% of their income and only living on 10. I mean, that's, that's unheard of for two interviews in a row to end up with that same goal. So I think this whole message of make it big and, and give big is really catching on. I right. can't thank you enough for your time, for your knowledge, for your answers. They were truly, truly epic, and I know people are going to have breakthroughs because of them. Thank you, Chris. Love you and your wife and everything that you're doing. This is I am so excited 
just about the idea behind this 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 podcast because honestly, man, you are a light in the darkness. You know, I'll close with this one last thought. A.W. Milne goes over to Africa and he goes over as a missionary to the, the, these headhunter tribes. When he dies, 40 years later, they write this on his gravestone. When he came, there was no light. When he left, there was no darkness. And I think that that's one thing that you're doing, man, is you're being such an example to all of these entrepreneurs. Uh, and this show is an inspiration to people to, to be generous. And, man, I just applaud you and your wife for taking this first step, man, and really being the trailblazer, uh, you know, as far as getting this, this, this message out there. So kudos to you, man. You're one of my new heroes. <laughs> I got chills. I got chills. Thanks a lot, my man. All right, brother. Talk to you soon. Thanks for listening. And if you loved this episode and know of someone else who is as successful as they are generous, please pass them on to me. It would mean the world to me if you help me get this cause and this message out to as many listeners as I can. So please, if you liked what you heard, it goes a long way if you take 30 seconds and leave me a five-star review and share this with your friends. I'll be forever grateful. And until the next episode, cheers to your success.